Mingalaba. For any Burmese language speakers tuning in today, we wanted to let you know that our Better Burma Mission has launched three Burmese language podcasts Myanmar Revolutionary Tales, Dark Era of Burma, and Myanmar Peace, Women, and Security. These programs can be found on our website as well as on any of your preferred podcast platforms. We invite you to take a listen. But for now, let's get on with this episode. Um, so I just start by saying I'm, I'm Trish. <laughs> um, I, I'm the owner of currently like the mama, uh, but I had my business called Poe for Men's back in Yangon, uh, pre-coup. And um, so I got involved in coup just uh, because... Well, I didn't see a purpose in continuing my business and not knowing the audience that I was serving. So p- consumers wise, it was quite hard to tell whether who they work for and like, you know, what 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 groups that they support. And second of all, when all the protests happening, then I was also out um, protesting as well. And I saw there was a need for there were so many hungry protesters and yeah there were other people donating and stuff like that but also I have an empty kitchen that's not being used and I realized to myself I'm like if I'm not serving food to customers and I still have my staffs and I still want to pay my staff um then I figure out you know what like just let me just um, cook really simple stuff. And then funding wise, I'm lucky enough to have um, friends in F&B industry who are able to get the word out uh, low key too. So we just mm-hmm. post stuff on Instagram story and mm-hmm. round up for uh, money. And then, you know, one thing leads to another. Um, she started um, her own fundraising stuff, and then she also has a kitchen. So we all we all kind of like collaborated on our own, and then we were able to serve about like five thousand protesters in total. And yeah, like so that's all that that's where it all started. Yeah, and then I stopped just because. Um, while I was um, out donating food, it got a bit dangerous because they recognized my face. And yeah, that's that's when I stopped. Mm, right. Yeah. Great. Thanks for sharing that. So as the protest happened and you were, well, I first the coup happened and then that's followed several days later by these nonviolent mass protests all over the city. And I did so many interviews at the time and talked to so many people. And, and it's really bringing me back <clears throat> to that context of this, the shock of it happening, followed by this mindset of, okay, where do I fit in? What do I do? Do I do, I do this part or I do that part? And people yeah. realizing not everyone needs to do the same thing. You know, yeah. we talked to, I don't know if you know Inda Aung So, but we had him on just several weeks afterwards. And he he was involved in like organic um, yeah. composting and such like that. And he and his yeah. wife decided they were just going to clean the streets. That was their job. They were going to pick up trash. That's all they did is they just picked up trash and left the streets cleaner than when they arrived. Okay. So you, you fit into this role of, because that's what you do, of cooking and serving food. So had you ever cooked food for, for that many people all at once before in that quantity? Uh, before, yes, I have. I have. Um, well, I, I, my background, I come, I, I chef and mm. I worked professionally for six years prior to the coup. Uh, sorry, no, actually seven years prior to the coup. So, uh, yeah, we, we had, like, different events and, like, you know, like, big, like, seminars that we were serving to people and stuff like that. But mm. it was never that you are paid to serve food, right, before. Mm-hmm. But now this is, like, I'm willing to donate this amount of food and I'm doing it on my own terms. And, like, mm. this is something that I truly believe that, you know, people got to, like, continue whatever that they're, pro- like, whatever that they're doing and then, I'm just, like you said, trying to find a foot in how I want to support in the best way that I can support, you know? So, mm. this is also something that I'm doing right now as well. <laughs> mm-hmm. 
Um, yeah. Mm, so you're cooking these mass amounts of food and giving them freely to the protesters. This is like a beautiful thing to do. This is, you know, Satana. This is this is really yeah. good well. And, you know, you're all you're doing is giving free food to nonviolent people assembled in the street. And yeah. yet that simple act, this is something our listeners li- growing up in free societies might not understand, that simple act put yeah. a target on you. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Because... Um, yeah, clearly, um, you know, there's no, like, people don't, like, well, the military supporters don't want um, any kind type of, like, like uh, uh, anyone supporting the protesters, right? Like, not discontinuing mm-hmm. the fight. So, yeah. Yeah. Mm, right. And in what way or shape did that threat manifest? How did you start to know that this simple act of just providing food was putting you at risk? Um, when my neighbors, cause I was only protesting in my neighborhood. So I am familiar with the area and I know I have like different exit strategy if like, should mm. there be any attacks? Right. Um, so my neighbors, um, that which is good and bad at the same time because they know my face and I've been living in that area for a really long time. Uh-huh. So um, yeah, my neighbors or uh, were like they started to warn me and they were like, you know what, like there has been talks, blah 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 blah, that you know they recognize you and they know like where you live and all these talks because like literally at the place that I live, the next street, <laughs> there's a police station at the end of the street, so. Even though, like, the police, like, don't like us, but at the same time, they are uh, police families and wives right. who, like, you know, that knows each other. We, we, we all grew up in the same neighborhood. Yeah. So um, as a good, um, yeah, like, just, like, low-key, just warning people not to go, like, you know, too crazy. So that's when I realized that, okay, I'm going to take a step back and... Um, mm. Also, I I got um, I was attacked by a smoke bomb um, mm-hmm. uh, while I was donating food, and uh, l- little did I know, like uh, it was it was kind of like a wake up call because I realized that I was not fit <laughs> to <laughs> to be a protester. Like I don't really, I'm not really like. I was a train for it. No, I mean, like, if you think about it, nobody was really trained for it. But yeah, right. me personally, um, just having that quick minded, like, you know, like finding exit strategy and whatnot. So I got caught in a smoke bomb and then I almost got arrested. But I I was lucky enough to have this one home, like, just drag me into their home and then um, kept mm. me for a few hours while the police were raiding the entire in the entire place. So when I got mm. back, it was, it was something I was, I was very shook, you know, and I had sure. to ask myself, like, um, how, how can I support this without harming my family, without harming mm. myself, mm-hmm. putting myself in prison? Like, that's not going to help. It. Like, that's not gonna, that's not gonna be helpful. Right. So, um, I got to stay alive as well and be safe um also yeah yeah. so i i think that's when i decided to move to towards um finding uh, like focusing more on fundraising without having my identity shown Uh so um yeah and then one thing leads to another um i ended up moving to bangkok and then becomes a much safer choice um, because then, you know, um, w- especially when they started hunting down people, um, n- not because like I've become like such an important figure or anything, mm-hmm. but it's just a matter of context. So if my yeah. other friends and associates, uh, are, if, if they did get arrested, then, you know, or if I get arrested, I don't want my friends in my contact list to get arrested, mm-hmm. that kind of thing. Um, and, or my family. Um, so yeah, that's, that's when I decided to make a move, um, to Thailand, um, on Mm. the 5th of April. Yeah. Mm, Right. So you've been displaced for over two years now. Two years. Yep. Yeah. Like so many others that are, 
uh, around the world and uh, that are uh, that that is just an ongoing displacement that one only hopes is not going to turn into something like the 88 generation of a, a a short what what people thought was a short term respite it ended up being a generation in a life you know let's yeah. really hope that that's not the situation we all find ourselves in now yeah yeah, we really hope so. Sometimes I do think that like, oh, this is a repetition of the past of yeah, the history. Yeah. And it's like, like it, but it's interesting too, because I get to, I become a lot closer with my parents because of the coup. Mm. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> and I also um, interested more connecting with my roots and food wise and that like urgency to really um Mm. preserve my culture in a way and represent my culture in a different country because being in thailand too it's a there's there's a stereotype on myanmar people that you know like we there's there's a stereotype you know um it's a different class we're refugees and then they're yeah so Having me here and representing my culture with food is extremely important. And also like knowing deeply about my culture and what it is for me. Mm, Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's a lot there. And it reminds me, you talk about how it made you connect more with your parents. And I did shortly after the coup, just weeks after the coup, I did an interview with Mimi A, who actually interviewed you several weeks after the coup. So somehow we already had our own interconnections then. But one of the things that Mimi A said that really stood out is when I asked her, because she was uh, she was one of the really prominent people using her platform to really speak out daily and educate and share information. And um, I asked her, what response are you getting from the young Burmese? And her answer really surprised me. She said, actually... They're saying thank you because they, many of them say that that oh. their their parents had told them about what this military was capable of when they were growing up, but of that younger generation, they never experienced it. And so they never really thought, they never really believed in the reality of it. But now that they were experiencing it just in those short weeks, and Mimi A was also using her platform at that time to describe what was happening, yeah. she was saying that that young Burmese were coming to her and it was kind of tragically heartwarming in what they were saying that that right. they actually believed and connected with their parents about yeah. the reality of the terror. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And the that also like a shocking um I think this revolution has become like infinitely like like it, not I would say like exponentially like um more revolutionary um just mm-hmm. because like younger generation like our generation we don't want to repeat i mean obviously we don't want this to be repeated to our kids um and also that we're able to sympathize with our parents and because it has always been a gap between especially burmese parents is that most of them don't really want their children to know the struggles that they they went through sure. and so they don't really talk about it so there's a lot of trauma in in them that they completely shut down and therefore they think that that's protecting their children right but really when we are like this coup is happening to us to our generation and we're like okay but we need to talk about this you know we need to talk about mm-hmm. mental health and there's a lot of so many other issues culturally mm-hmm. too that's been so suppressed um mm-hmm. and then we're like okay we need to talk about it we need to talk about the rohingya we need to talk about yeah. like we need, to, we need to apologize to all right. the other ethnics and um um, the the so called like people who in the jungle are labeled as uh, rebels, but they're not really rebels. They're just yep. protecting their their families, yep. you know. And then we're able to sympathize with a lot of people, you know, and we start to be um, a little bit selfless in mm. a way, yeah. So those are a lot of really heavy themes that you just went over there. Where do all those themes intersect with food? Because you were saying that food has been your medium. You you alluded to this earlier in the interview and your your social media posts really go into this in a lot more detail, that food has been your medium and entryway into these other concepts. So mm-hmm. in what way are you using food as that medium? 
Um, basically community building. Um, so I've noticed that uh, it, bring, it brings a lot of money, first of all. Mm, right. uh, when I first moved to Bangkok, that was like the most easiest way to mm. uh, break through this, this whatever barrier it is or like introduce to either do a pop-up or uh, a fundraising event. And that was like, okay, let's, we got to have some food. Um, so that's an easy entry into um, conveying our messages Mm-hmm. Um, and making a political statement or like making an, uh, uh, an, ex- an art exhibition. So pe- people, people warm up to it. So that's one thing. Mm-hmm. Um, second of all is I've noticed that a lot of people, um, who are displaced here, it, we're not thinking about short term, huh? Like we're talking, we're talking about like a long term thing. So people start to miss home. Right. And then like, there's no, there's, there's, you can't really like, even though they're like Burmese restaurants around, there's no sense of community. There's no sense of like, we miss going to someone else's house and <laughs> eat for free, or we miss someone yeah. being invited to uh, a flu, you know, like a mm-hmm. little donation thing that yeah. we normally do. So we miss that kind of vibe where we just sit down and eat and, pretty much talk bullshit <laughs> and just most of the time we yeah um talk we we would most of the time we try not to talk about politics in these um in these events or like where the the parties that i host mostly um and we just you know like it's it's a time it's a it's a bit of a break from whatever that they are dealing with and they're able to de-stress eating mm. my food and then reminiscing home, thinking of home, like eating a bowl of mohinga. I was like, oh, I miss mom now. And then, you know, they go home belly full and a little oh. bit um, energized again for the next going back to um, whatever that they have to go back to. So um, mm. I've, I've noticed the power in that and energizing people in that sense. So... Yeah, mm, And you've described your work as using food as a medium that breaks down stereotypes. Can you expand on in what way food, in, in what ways can food do that? Stereotypes. Okay. So, um, when I first, when I lived in Thailand, um, worked and lived in Thailand the past 10 years, um, a lot of the, 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 Myanmar is the closest country to Thailand. Come on. Mm-hmm. And, there hasn't been a single Burmese restaurant in Thailand that's like, oh, we got to go eat Burmese food. You know, you see like Vietnamese mm. food. You you see mm-hmm. like so many like great Japanese restaurant here. Mm. But what about Burmese food? It's the closest to us, but people are not interested in us. And then, and, and it's a, it's a, they are brainwashed to think that Burmese food is like dirty, you know, yeah, yeah. unimportant. So, uh-huh. and that's, the way they think about food is also um, how they think about the people as well. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. And that becomes an issue. So for us to really raise awareness about whatever, uh, what's happening in Myanmar, you know, you got to like start tracking down to like, you want this country, Thai people to really care about our issue, then we got to start breaking down these stereotypes as well. Mm. Um, And I find that food is like a very easy way to um, food storytelling and Mm -hmm. entice people into like talking about geopolitics or Mm. um, the root of like, you know, different, like let's do a Mohinga trail. And I host like different food, food storytelling dinners just Mm. to educate them about regional food, for example, Mm -hmm. and that shows that, just to tell them that we we are diverse, you know, Myanmar is not mm. just about like Mohinga or like Myanmar right. is not just about Bama people, like Yangon mm. people, you know, mm. Mm. and there's so many different eth- ethnics as well. So that's one stereotype that I want for Thai people is that we, we are, we are, we are humans mm. <laughs> just like everyone else, you know. And second of all, uh, another stereotype is within us. I think it's, uh, I don't even know what's it called, like reverse, like, like, uh, 
racial profile. Like uh-huh. um, <laughs> within within our Burmese community, you know, um, or or even with like uh, ethnic communities as well. You know, they, everything is so like they 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 cling on to their little groups. <laughs> mm-hmm. So Chin people are like really proud of their Chin Chin stuff and the Karen food, like Karen mm-hmm. people, you know, like mm-hmm. the Karen food is amazing. Like it, it is true. They're all amazing. They're like, yeah. don't get me wrong. Also, even Bama food, right? But because mm-hmm. Bama is so predominant and they claim they claim territories too much. Yeah. And it, and that reflects on what 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 the big the big issue that we're having as well. Um mm-hmm. and, and and like how are we gonna build like federalism when we can't even <laughs> call peace on like this food like territories, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Like so like this the most simple thing, then we're struggling with it. And then okay, how can we bring unity among us? How can we bring like, okay, your chin food is as good as uh, Kaya food, you know, or like embrace it, embrace different, mm. different ethnicities, and then try to um, instill that, that respect for each other. So mm. which is why uh, uh, the main concept um, for Can Stop, Bone Stop, Bavand was, um, I, well, I was the main organizer for the vendors and I wanted to bring that community and show people that how diverse uh, Myanmar is. And there are so many different types of food. Um, and I, I just I, I just did it as I wanted to be, I wanted that to be as part of an education. And it's kind of like a, 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 a trip to Myanmar, <laughs> but in, in in that event. So, yeah. Mm, that's great. So you're you're exposing not only the range of Burmese food to non-Burmese, especially Thai in the neighboring country and there's so many Burmese immigrants now and migrants and various various legal statuses in uh, Thailand right now, but you're also exposing um, different ethnic food mm. to primarily Bamar people and yeah. uh, and through the interest in that ethnic food wanting to promote an interest in the ethnic group itself. And I think that's a really cool thing because it's like kind of piquing this curiosity. And yeah. um, and any time that you can succeed in piquing a curiosity to to yeah. start asking questions and start to be interested and start to want right. to lean forward, that opens other doors. And, yeah. and so I guess the question I have for that is, do you find traditionally that uh, of all these different ranges of of ethnic foods that are available in Myanmar, traditionally, would you say that Bamar people have not really been all that interested or curious in them? And that's that's something that you're trying to start and promote? There, there has been interest in the late years, um, like pre, like a little bit before pre when I when I went back to t- 2019. And I've noticed an influx of like kitchen or Karen food in my area, the neighborhood that I was living as opposed to like 10 years, like 20 years ago. Right. Um, but people are not like generally accustomed to like, mm, like chasing it down <laughs> for Karen food or kitchen food. Um, yeah, I don't I don't know how else to put it, but it's um it's it's just that I think I think the essence of it is like um like every every home has this let's just say one dish that they're really like proud of, you know? And and I think that that's biggest issue. <laughs> in a way that that ego of like oh i'm so like um 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 proud of this food and blah, blah, blah. my mom makes the best blah 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 yes mm. it's true mm-hmm. but you gotta also accept that other people makes good mohinga as your mom as well or like in in let's just say uh malamyai also have their type of mohinga but that doesn't mean that they are better than us mm-hmm. Yeah. And that becomes a bit of an issue <laughs> trying to explain to people. Yes, like, you know, they, it, it's regional stuff that, you know, you go to like um, Dongu area and then why they why they make 
this way, why they use specific ingredients and why not like Yangon, you know? And then mm -hmm. um, there, there is no, yeah, there like we, we have to eliminate that idea of we are better than another, another ethnic, you know? Yeah. Mm, right. And one of the things that you've been doing as well is collecting and chronicling indigenous recipes from mm. different ethnic groups. Talk about that project. Uh, so it, it, this is uh, this is just a passion project. Um, I had a I, and it all like it, it all started from a trigger <laughs> when I was watching Chef's Table and there was like the last episode I think and they were um, yeah it, it was a the Mayan chef and she was able to really like you know tell her story and her culture and then keep the traditions and I was so triggered <laughs> and I felt like. Uh, like back like this was like two years ago so I was still going through my dramas and I felt the loss and I was griefing so much of not being able to preserve my culture and not being able to really research on what I wanted to do originally was to just you know learn about recipes and write a cookbook and archive and like that was that was mm -hmm. my interest um so the fact that I cannot go back home to do that was was a really hard thing to chew, uh -huh. and I, and and the worst thing is that because so many talented cooks, so many restaurants and uh, family homes have now been like attacked or like there's there's there, yeah. yeah there's so many losses, uh -huh. and the fact that I'm unable to. Re recorded and it becomes like a almost like a FOMO <laughs> of like oh no mm -hmm. like will I ever be able to record like the best like blah 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 mm -hmm. um, so I, I started from there and I started archiving the like whatever recipes I learned from other people and I'd be like just like write it down you know for just mm. it's just for my own <laughs> reference um, yeah yeah yeah. Yeah, that's great. I think, and I think even putting something like that on paper, it just it that formal process in a way kind of does something invalidating or legitimizing, you know, the the the, the value of a recipe like this vis-a-vis -vis a recipe from any other culture and cuisine. So right. that's yeah, that's that's great. I um I, I know there's been a lot of really cool and different kind of Burmese cookbooks over the years and in the transition period, various various new kinds of takes on on that came out. And there were some ones I thought were pretty good, but, you know, come to think of it, I can't remember ever really seeing a catalog of, of um, that went beyond the Burmese cooking. I mean, sometimes it dips into Shan or something. But um, mm -hmm. but certainly the the more far afield recipes uh, that there's, that one could track down. I mean, just as one random example that comes to me, I remember one time visiting a friend in Chiangu, which was, there's a lot of Chiangus. This is the mm -hmm. Chiangu outside of Moniwa. And he um, he just started going into all this detail about how special the samosa salad was in mm -hmm. Changu and how it had won like national awards and like mm -hmm. you know the shop had like had this history and everything else. And we we he took me to a cafe that looked like any cafe I've seen you know anywhere throughout the rural countryside, like nothing special at all. And sat down and just had like one of the most amazing, I, I'd never had, I didn't know what samosa salad was, but it was just mouthwatering. I mean, I must've had like three or four <laughs> servings of just like, yeah. keep that coming. Like that's amazing. And you know, yeah. there's gotta be these little pockets of, of yeah. little specialties that y you need to have your own networks and contacts. Yeah. Like, like I had my friend in that case that can just guide you right to the, um, you know, there's no guidebook as of now. And of course, right. uh, it's not a peaceful time, but, um, but they're, they're even in the transition period, I didn't know about any projects that were trying to track these things down. Right, right. Um, and on, on top of it, too, um, there hasn't been any archives on Burmese, uh, Myanmar, I wouldn't say Burmese, but like Myanmar recipes, mm -hmm. cookbooks. Like in Thailand, you see like, oh, uh, you could you could track down like royal food or like what they ate at the palace or like... Mm -hmm. Um, you know, cookbooks from like 50 years ago, even, or like way back into like, you, you, there's, there's a library full of it. But mm. then I don't know what they ate at in Mandalay, like during mm. <laughs> the right. pick, you know what I mean? Like, 
And it, no one knows either. And it's always been like, oh, I'm not sure. Maybe this and maybe that. And it's always mm. been that water mouth thing that makes it very difficult for um, anyone who's researching. So mm. um, the fact that, uh, and, and that becomes worse, the fact that I can't go home <laughs> even to talk to people to even have like that water mouth thing. So um, yeah, but Another thing is, uh, what was I going to say? I, ha- I lost my train of thought. Uh, <laughs> is, um, um, like, like as a, as a, can I ask you a question? Uh-huh. Yeah. Yeah. Like as a, as a foreigner, like what did you, what was your like impression with like Burmese food? I will give a very non-traditional answer from what most foreigners would say for two different reasons. Um, one is that I'm vegetarian, and okay. um, and the second is that the thing that drew me to Myanmar initially at, before I was able to find a life there with work and whatnot was meditation, and so um, and and so the 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 monastery style of food is is yeah. as. Uh, as familiar to me as as restaurants or home cooking, so that's and that's a kind of a different beast. Um, and so, by by virtue of being vegetarian, I like kind of peripherally know the 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 meat and fish dishes. I have no idea how they taste, and and um, I, I no idea how they're made or anything. So it's like a whole slew of uh, of dishes that I'm just not familiar with. But um, but from my own kind of limited and and and, and unique perspective. Um, my first time that I went to Myanmar, the food was really, really difficult because mm-hmm. I I didn't know how to speak Burmese. I didn't know anything about Burmese food. And I basically had like oily fried rice or oily, um, ri- oily fried rice or oily fried noodles every meal. It was like three meals a day I had. That's, that's what I had. And I was like, oh my God, I don't know. When I went to live there, I was like, I don't know how I, I, I can... Um, you know, um, how I'm, how I'm going to be able to live off of this. And of course I can, when I was living there, I can cook for myself, but in terms of going out or going to monasteries. But then as I started spending more time there, I just learned mm-hmm. about, you know, if you go, if you go to like normal tourist places and you're a vegetarian, that is about the only thing you can get is, is, ve- right. is, is fried rice or noodles. Right. But one of the things I ended up really liking about Burmese food was that they, they generally don't cook vegetable, you know, the vegetarian stuff, vegetables, beans, tofu, they don't cook that with meat and fish. So like if you go to Japan or China, like good luck, you know, good luck finding a single dish that just doesn't have just specks of meat or fish in it. But once you know what what those, you know, the names of those dishes that that don't have meat or that traditionally aren't made with meat or fish, I, I mean, it's fine. It's no problem. You can go anywhere. And, um, you know, and I would, I would meet meditators who are vegetarian that came into Myanmar for the first time and they would have the same experience. Like before I met them, they mm-hmm. would be really struggling with food. And then I'd hang out with them. We go to a monastery or a <laughs> restaurant and I just rattle off like five dishes and they're like, oh, this is the healthiest I've ever eaten. So yeah. it just took some time for me to get accustomed to that. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. I mean, like I, I, I think that's also another thing that was very eye opening for me and I had to learn it like slowly because I was so, assimilated and assimilated I would say assimilated into this very western idea of like if you go through French like I graduated from a French culinary school it's very bougie Mm -hmm. it's very fancy Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and worked in like a Michelin place and like different like fancy restaurants and thinking that that is food that is like a, Mm -hmm. a, a, a higher cuisine like whatever that was Mm -hmm. And it, it took me a while to like break myself down mentally to like, mm. um, you know, like food. It's it's at the end of the day, it's all about being like having delicious food. That like that's it. Mm. You know, whether mm. you do all the technique stuff, fancy stuff, whatever. Mm. And I couldn't connect it with what I was doing with my career before as a mm. like, this fancy hungry like young cook and Mm. i had to ask myself like as a burmese right or a myanmar person like what what is the essence of like burmese burmese food myanmar food Mm. Mm -hmm. and that was just bringing people together and having that community vibe Mm. Mm. and that means like really simple 
rustic charm to it. Mostly monastery food, <laughs> which is mm-hmm. our favorite thing to go to. And, mm-hmm. Or like eating at my mom's place or like a family's home, like a Sunday gathering with your families. And those are things that mm-hmm. mm, brings more joy than other bougie stuff. <laughs> Mm, right. I don't know if you're familiar with Dave Chang, but the yeah. way you describe your relationship to, to French food is, is similar to how I've heard him speak about it, is uh, yeah. just this um, this kind of um, massive standard that that you're, that ha- brings about this overwhelming and overbearing sense to want to get right, but then it, and, and there's some beautiful and amazing things about it, but then it also can can suffocate you and overwhelm you yeah. in trying to figure out where you as a non-French and even a non-white, yes. um, you know, from uh, from an, uh, a, an Asian culture, in your case, yeah. even more than Dave Chang's, who's Korean, yeah. from an uh, an Asian culture that is, is lesser known than like the Chinese or Thai or, or Japanese yeah. kind of cuisine. So, yeah. yeah. And it, it also breaks my heart is to, I, I mean, like, on a business aspects, like I understand why people charge so little about like so little of their food as it's just the income gap and the consumer spending power and whatnot for Bernese food. And they want to target like Myanmar people. Um, but at the same time, that devalues your food. And I have an mm-hmm. issue with that. So but someone who's making like hen- handmade egg noodle for years you know, mm-hmm. it's like a generational pass down through and en- like uh, through families, like three generation. Like I, I know this one person who's like, she's she's a noodle master, my mom's friend, and but she cannot like increase her price for these noodles just because, mm-hmm. you know, spending power or whatnot, and especially at mm-hmm. a time like this now. Um, so, it, but it devalues her craft. You know, and to a yep. point where now she stopped producing egg noodle, which is which is something that it it, it breaks my heart because um, this is something that needs to be continued. This is something that yeah, yeah. we should be proud of that no one can do it except her, you know, and uh-huh. that's the same thing with our the iconic uh, La Pat at the fermented uh-huh. tea leaves uh-huh. is that people are re- like devaluing it by just, you know, first of all, people should like stop like explaining to me. Like it, it, it's okay if you like don't know about what La Pet is, but we got to start uh-huh. calling La Pet as La Pet and not like, oh, it's fermented tea leaf salad and try to like mm. translate it into English. Like stop. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So like, uh, like, <laughs> it's it's annoying um and it's it's like all these like small little things it becomes like a little bit draining mentally as well like as as a chef and as a cook like this like overly explaining a lot of things and having Mm -hmm. to put so much effort into like no you have to like like there's not only one type of curry in Myanmar food there's like thousands (laughs) and then there's different names for it you know and please learn but it's a, that get that that's what makes it fun too for people who are non Burmese to like, um, especially curious eater, who and and I've seen it so much in Chiang Mai. Chiang Mai has has changed in like, in the last two years, mm-hmm. uh, and especially Thai. This is what I'm like incredibly like shook is um like at, at cm at Chiang Mai university there's so many like myanmar students now and obviously that influences a lot and then from there on and it, it just keeps on growing and mm-hmm. also so many myanmar restaurants here oh. as well um like insane amount of myanmar restaurants so yeah. um, i i think that la pa la pa the fermented tea leaf salad has become like such an iconic um, mm. food for, mm-hmm. especially for vegetarians and vegans. Um, and it's, it's a good, it's a good leeway to tell the world that, Oh, it's from Burma. And it's like, I yeah. call Burma, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Well, staying on the subject of fermentation, which I, I absolutely love. I love to yeah. experiment with, uh, with fermentation myself. Yeah. Um, but um you, you've obviously we have you have a levette, which is a fermented tea leaf salad, as you mentioned. But 
um, you uh, carried on this po ferments, which was mm-hmm. um, not only mm-hmm. I believe this was before the coup. Mm-hmm. Not only was this a, um, a fermenting all kinds of things in Myanmar, right. but as you talk about with uh, the other projects that you're doing, it's it's concerned about authenticity and right. tradition and sustainability right. and. Um, an indigenous kind of fermentation. So tell us about, as, as far as you know it and are able to explain, tell us both about the history of fermentation in Bamar and other ethnic foods, uh, how, it, how it's been done in, in previous years, how, what fermentation techniques they used and, and, uh, and what they fermented, and then also its place in the cooking. I mean, because fermentation is so interesting in that it, it gives such unique tastes and flavors as different yeah. chemical combinations are unlocked that you, even the way that you, you would put a fermented item in a dish or you would eat it along with other dishes yeah. is, not, is not like other food because it's, yeah. so, it's so unique in terms of what it does to the palate. So also talk not only about where fermentation has been seen traditionally, but then how it's used in in dishes and serving. Okay. So, um, well, as far as I know with, uh, from what I research, um, uh, Myanmar people like uh, use fermentation as a tool to preserve uh, food waste uh, and cut cut down food waste and if we, we don't have fridges I mean if you go to like rural areas like fridges are like a new thing <laughs> back home and in some areas uh, mm. there's no fridges so they have to learn different ways of fermenting depending on the region so for example ponyji which is a fermented horse gram um, it's, it's, a, it's a type of black beans legume and it's Famous in um, Bagan area, like they're known for that. That's like when you go to Bagan, you got to buy that. Um, and how they do is that, first of all, legume, it's hard to keep, but they grow abundance of it over there. And how do they preserve it is by fermenting, by steaming it, and then by fermenting it, and then uh, take out the water completely, moisture out so that it's like a thick like black paste that can stay for years. And then you could just add it into curries and um, yeah, like, or like eat it as as part of a salad. But the whole idea is like long shelf life without using any uh, uh, fridge storage. Um, When you look at Sean, they, it's, it's a bit colder climate. So, Mm -hmm. and like, Especially like December time, um, they the the area that I live, especially um, my dad, my dad's part a uh, half Shan, so um, they have a lot of these like uh, uh, pigs, and uh, that's when they uh, they when you break down a pig, it's big. You know, you can't just live mm. it. Up. You just eat it at one go. So mm. you have to learn how to uh, preserve these with like by curing. So there's a lot of cured meats and Shan Shan uh, Shan stayed, and then they learned this this through the the migration from um, the, from China. Like so, that a lot of like Chinese descendants migrating into uh, Shan area. So the techniques that they use for curing meats are very similar to um, how Chinese cured the meats. Mm. Um, and uh, pickles, for example, the Shan pickles are like like super well known for Shan noodles. You have like on the side, like this little Shan pickles using um, um, alcohol and also, and um, what else do they use? Like salt um, mm-hmm. and, and a lot of like mala, like base, like, like spicy kick. And that's also very uh, Chinese influence as well. And um, if you go closer to like a uh, chin area, for example, like, like in chin, chin state, um, uh, meat is very rare. So they ferment mm. a lot of vegetables instead. Mm-hmm. So mm. a lot of it has to do with um, not having fridge storage. Um, and mm. uh, it also cut down food waste as well. You know, like um, um, if, if you look at the whole country where I, where, where, it, it, food, food, we're poor. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So yeah, for sustainability uh, purpose and how it's been used as well. Like, just like I explained, like, because fermentation, like fermented stuff are so like uh, intense, we don't really like eat it as like how like the Germans eat sauerkraut, you know what I mean? Like, right. 
Yeah. It's something like really tiny and small and like mm -hmm. uh, like on the side. Like it's never the hero of the dish. It's just only <laughs> <a> supporting <laughs> factor. Um, but it's 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 I, La Pet. La Pet is a type of fermentation. Um, yeah. So that whole um, I I I I went down through a research loophole of like how La Pet came about, and then oh. yeah, it's originally from China, mm. but. Um, with the trade, they just have too too much. Um, in China and India, when mm -hmm. they were doing all the the the, the tea tea trade, mm -hmm. and they just don't know what to do with it. <laughs> you know, it's like they're just growing all over the country, and it's like, what do we do with it? And uh, like, someone must have spilled like a bunch of like salt, and it was like, whoops. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> like, and then next thing you know and it's like fermenting in like big pots of um mm. yeah big pots of clay pots and yeah the process in itself is like so tedious and meticulous and labor like intensive so i'm i'm so impressed by how how mm. Lepet, like how Lepet has grown over the years mm. you know yeah. Mm. That's interesting what you mentioned about the lack of refrigeration. We had a podcast guest on recently who was a, a former advisor to the, um, uh, I don't remember the exact name of the ministry, like Ministry of Energy and Electricity or something before the mm -hmm. coup, a uh, Canadian guy. And he was just talking about the the difference of an electrified life and how much a community can change when it gets when yeah. it gets electrified and just things I I had never considered uh, of of how just how I mean it's so obvious once you think about it just how many things it gives you when when you get that and NLD wasn't perfect but it did yeah. it did do a lot with the grid and it yeah. brings me back to my memory of one of my Burmese teachers when this was actually before the transition. So he is like probably middle class at that time. This is why he was able to to just have a slight improvement in, in his life. But um, one day he came to class and he said, um, before the class started, he was just beaming and he said, we just got our a refrigerator and he was so happy. And it was like, you know, first refrigerator they ever had and just beaming that they now had a refrigerator. And I was like, oh, that's that's really interesting. Oh. And, I, and we're talking and I say to him, so yeah, you have this new refrigerator. How, how's that going to change your life? What are you going to put in it? Yeah. And he just stares back at me completely blank. Like, <laughs> like, just like his head's about to explode. And then he <laughs> says, water. <laughs> and um, I've never forgotten that story because it, it was just so amazing to think about how proud he was to get his first refrigerator. But because he had lived a life and he had lived just fine, a life without refrigeration, yeah. that he, he knew that this was something that in a modern world you were supposed to have. But because, and, and so it's a real, you know, it's always fun to get new gadgets. But because he had never actually utilized that, he, he didn't. And I'm sure after a week or a month or something, he started to learn what he could put there. But when he was just conceptualizing, he, he literally had no idea what he could use it for except for cold water. <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> Mm. that's funny yeah i mean like if you think about it uh, you know if it weren't for like the fact that there's there was no fridge refrigeration system um like we had lapel we had all of these great fermented food yeah yeah like, if there was fridge like available to everyone you know like people wouldn't be like fermenting as much as like yeah, as much as we thought it would be. Well, sure. Well, I, I remember I was when I was in Colorado and looking yeah. at these um, these old mountain homes from like the 19th century, and they had these recreations of of how pioneers lived. Yeah. And I remember them showing the a desk, and they pulled out like a bottom drawer of the desk, yeah. and they were like, "This is where they would ferment the yeah. the, the the bread, the flour for bread, yeah. um, in order to to cook bread." And it was just like this kind of enclosed wooden bottom drawer that just didn't get a, a lot of air or moisture or anything and so it was just kind of naturally what they used to to ferment flour because that was the only way they get bread i mean this is this is a, a common of human history of you know before you get these uh yeah. these kind of modern accoutrements yeah yeah exactly i mean like the same goes with ngopi as well the ngopi eh? Mm -hmm. um, the 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 sight little um, very intense like fish mm. sauce uh, mm -hmm. almost but it's mm -hmm. a thick um, fish paste mm -hmm. and um, I went I went to one of the production house and literally like 
there's insane amount of, I mean hygiene first of all is not uh-huh. a, a, not a Myanmar thing <laughs> but when it comes to fermentation throughout the years that I've learned that you have to be like really clean but it is what it is and then it was very interesting to see the process of how they um yeah how they process the ngabie and it's just mm-hmm. like like you know, like fish is like the most, like if you eat fish fresh, right? Mm, like that's mm-hmm. the common thinking, but no, we eat fish rotten. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and people don't realize the amount of probiotics that you're getting um, from eating this on a daily basis. Every home mm. having a BA, like yeah. no doubt about that. Yeah. And um, what they do and, and the stereotype, this is another stereotype that I hate is, like even within our Myanmar community, some of the very like superficial class, like that very like high, like um, brainwashed, I would almost say class is um, that Ngabie is smelly, stinky, whatever. Mm -hmm. And, um, and that is, that is not the right way to, to, you know, represent your culture, you know, like, or like whenever like people serve, like I have been told one time that like, Oh, don't serve like a PA as the, at this pop-up, this was pre coup And I was like, why? And I was like, Oh, like it's smelly. It's smelly for foreigners. Like, you know, Mm -hmm. like, like foreigners can't take that like intense smell. And I'm like, what about blue Mm -hmm. cheese? Like blue cheese is as smelly as a PA too. Like what are you talking about? (laughs) wine for example it it might be great but it's like it's not so it's disgusting for other people like it's just Mm. (laughs) so it's like you know like that stereotypes of that yeah so Mm, right and going back into family tradition and whatnot one post that you made on your page caught my eye that maybe you can go into the story you, you're not just looking at tradition in terms of different cultures or ethnicities, but also in terms of your own family. And you tell a story about your, um, I think it's your great-grandmother, uh, Da Echi, that, um, that was the breadwinner of the family and that had a yeah. special dish that she cooked. So tell her story. Oh, okay. She has a very interesting story. So this was during World War II, and her husband died like passed away he was the breadwinner and that's why she had to like start it hustling and mm. during that time the the japanese uh soldiers were were like conquering um so she ended up selling onokasue which is a coconut noodle uh mm. soup and mm-hmm. um she dressed up as a a man because at that time remember that like um with these conquests there comes um sexual harassment rape Mm. and like all these stuff so um but she still got to bring food for (laughs) their family and Mm. it was like right next to this um this japanese like office or something and on the side they gave her this one free slot for her to open a shop Mm. so she had her mohinga um stall there and fed a lot of Japanese soldiers, and at the same time, because she was, she was a smart lady, and then she ended up picking up like different Japanese words. So like she she had a good um, relationship with them. Um, so they ended up like she ended up being that like trustworthy person. Like oh like this this you know like um, um, this late not lady like this guy who runs a Onokasura store, and then later on like. You know, she started um, going into these offices uh, and stealing like canned food mm. mm-hmm. <laughs> for her family, so they get to eat like a lot of good food back mm-hmm. for their kids, like canned like stuff. Um, yeah, so um, that's the the dish is just iconic because it's usually coconut noodle onokasure. We cook it with um, chicken, but she used beef as well, just to cater to different mm. um, a different uh, Japanese crowd. And yeah, so I, I like we kept it in the family, and mm. like, every like yeah, there are three generations now. Mm, that's great. And there's also a story that you share about the type of mohinga that, that you're serving. So if you could, if I could also get you to to tell the story about where that mohinga recipe comes from. Okay, 
uh, Mohinga recipe. Um, my Mohinga recipe is for my mom. Uh, she's from Yangon. Hmm. And she she just ba- she learned it from my grandpa, uh, my no my grandma's uh, my great grandma. Yeah, she learned from my great grandma, and it's actually a recipe that she kind of like tweaked around over the years um, on like like ratio wise and whatnot. But it's it's yango mohinga, which is mm-hmm. we use uh, a equal amount of. Uh, chickpeas and a uh, fish bone broth mm-hmm. and uh yeah yeah so that's that's yango mohinga i think what you're referring is to my another friend who i was doing pop-up with on miss lunatic right. hers is very interesting uh because mm-hmm. uh her mohinga comes from uh, it's Mol- Molamye, um mm. mo- mohinga but she mm-hmm. learned it in a refugee her mom sold um, mohinga at a refugee camp when they mm. were displaced in Thailand um, and yeah like uh, then that stayed in their family mm. and um, it's, it's her Molamye mohinga yeah that her mom taught Mm, that's really cool. That that's yeah. great. Yeah. Um, getting back kind of earlier to your story, you <clears throat> reference all the years you spent uh, training in a French cooking academy and then yeah. going to Michelin restaurants. So, yeah. uh, go back to your experience of learning French cuisine and and what drove you to go on that career route. Um. <laughs> so I was basically um, studying. Uh, at a university here um, in Thailand before the culinary journey. And I was uh, studying marketing and hospitality. Um, and I, I, just did, I, I just did it because, you know, I got to make my Asian parents proud <laughs> and I just like mm-hmm. earn a degree, that kind of thing. And then I just mm-hmm. had... Uh, I, I lost my interest to work, like on like fourth year and I was failing really miserably. Uh-huh. So I dropped out and then I figured like, okay, I got to do something about my life now. And also like not be uh, the disappointment of the family. <laughs> um, and I joined mm-hmm. the culinary school and it happens to be a fancy like French culinary school here. And um, yeah, like little, little, like uh, I, I was a spoiled kid. So for me to like join that culinary school, like the French way, the very like military style kind of training <laughs> and yeah. very like punctual stuff. I I ate that up like, like crack. <laughs> oh, I was, Yeah. Like I was like, that was something that was lacking in my life, the discipline. Oh, and, I see. Right. So I you took to that. You didn't rebel against it. I know, like I took it to my heart and I, I okay. loved it. And that really like helped me shape who I am right now because uh-huh. it's that disciplinary thing that I find it something of my, my strong traits. And huh. um, yeah, and and at what I'm gonna call the when I and after I graduated, I started working at a Michelin restaurant, right? Like, and that was like, like intense. And mm. everything is so like, like he's, he's the, the mentor was, he's such a perfectionist and it's a mission. Mm-hmm. And so like everything depends, like you're so pressured, like you, like your, your error margin is zero. Mm. <laughs> and, and I started from like the basic, like commie stage. Like, so it's like the base, the base mm. level entry level, and then like mm. work my way up. So there is matters of like stereotypes as well and and a lot of things that you have to you face and not just like me doing the whole disciplinary or like climbing that like ladder um, but also having to break stereotypes of working with Thai people mm-hmm. like with the locals that it's okay for you to take the command from a Burmese person. <laughs> oh, I see. It's a very blue collar job, right? Giving a very yeah. white collar attention. And then yeah. w- I became sous chef at this restaurant. And then people were like, why? She's Myanmar. <laughs> She's uh-huh. Burmese. Uh-huh. Why are you giving me orders? You know, so it's uh-huh. very hard for like newcomers or like interns to grasp that idea. And then, 
you know, it was very challenging because I was specifically put the, to that task of like uh, training mm-hmm. um, Thai, like new kids who joined the, the restaurant. So um, it, it was quite tough. Yeah. And mm-hmm. yeah. so that's really interesting that you you didn't just learn <clears throat> the, how, the the process of French cuisine, but also this French militaristic style mm-hmm. around mm-hmm. how the kitchens are run, which I've also heard about. And then when you eventually switched over to do more locally Burmese things, was it hard to kind of get, I mean, I can't think of two things that are at greater odds, just the relaxed kind of anything goes attitude of feeling that yeah. you Burmese kitchen, just, yeah. just, um, just uh, the, the way the cooking process is going and something as militarized as, as French. So yeah. was that like a real culture shock and going back and forth? Yeah, I mean, it, it, at first it took me a while to get used to, especially um, learning from my mom, is that she just, she doesn't measure anything. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and it, it was a, a bit of a, it, it was a major struggle. And yeah. I just get really meticulous about a lot of things. But it's the, and you know, like I learned from, on, on the civil lining is that you get the best of be- best of the both worlds. So like that whole like meticulous stuff of like measuring stuff. And then I get to learn with my mom about like soul food and then having that, like, like feeling it and then like intuitions mm-hmm. and like, like just really being in the moment, um, mm-hmm. but able to also record <laughs> whatever she put that and put in the dish. So yeah, like it was, it was a struggle at first, but then now I've like you know set up a system where I'm, it's a bit more easier, yeah, to work through it. So it's, it's been mm, and, nice actually. And why did you make the decision to move on from all those years of French training and Michelin restaurants into this is before the coup, obviously, mm-hmm. into during coming back to me and Marjorie in the transition period and mm-hmm. really doing an about face in terms of going back into your own culture into mm-hmm. other food cultures in this country and start to develop the many things that you were developing before the the coup? Okay, so uh, okay, pre coup 2019, I I quit my job here at this Michelin restaurant. I went back out of like major spite and visa issues and I, oh. I can not stay in Thailand anymore. And I, uh, so I went back and I was like, okay. And like, it's a pretty much a petty call. Cause I was like, I'm going to, I'm going to show you like what I'm capable of pretty much. Mm. So it was like a very egotistical move. But then the messed up thing is that I was trying to, well, in my head that I thought that I was elevating the cuisine by bringing a French snare, like flair mm. to it. Mm-hmm. But really, if you think about it, all I was trying to do was whitewashing it. <laughs> and that, it. Was, mm. that pissed me off, but it took me a long time to realize that, which is when I got to like last year, almost like I just made a decision that this whole thing that I believed in, in mm-hmm. elevating the cuisine and making it super fancy and doing mm-hmm. the fine dining, like Myanmar course menu thing is so mm-hmm. whitewashed. Mm-hmm. And I, f- I started to feel very uncomfortable about it because mm-hmm. it, it not only, not only it's like, like, um, like devaluing the culture, mm-hmm. but it also was, was not what like it was also like becoming like not me you know and i mm. had to remain like what i am right now at the very moment is to represent what i'm going through and mm. represent my culture at its best and mm. yeah so i let go of anything so i and like i i tried working at different restaurants like um uh, mm. the first year Cause you know, like I gotta make some money and it, it was horrible. <laughs> hmm. I felt no connection to what I thought that I used to love. And it was the same guy that I used to work for the Michelin guy. And then I went back hmm. to his, his restaurant and then they sent me down to Phuket for another gig. And then I just felt so disconnected. And the worst thing is that the family that I was serving give off very cronies vibe. You know, it's like a rich family that was just like literally you know, hiring like 50 people to serve them. And Mm. 
And that felt so disconnected. And that made me so angry because like, I'm like, I'm fighting for a cause. I literally moved to Thailand to fight like this, this Mm -hmm. very superficial crony stuff. And like, what, what am I doing? And then, yeah, that's like, it was started. That was the beginning of me trying to uh, like break away from all of, um, yeah. Like, what do you say? Like, uh, colonizing mind, <laughs> mm-hmm. decolonizing my mind. Yeah, there you go. That's the word. Decolonizing my mind slowly. Yeah. So. Mm, and how did you learn to do that? What did it mean to decolonize your mind in terms of food? And what what are the ways that you learned of how Burmese food can be presented and shared and enjoyed mm. in a way where it's not being whitewashed? Um. First of all, like I had to figure out if I'm doing pop-ups or fundraising or like anything like event wise or selling my mm-hmm. product, then I have to bring in that authenticity. Like what is my target market? If Am I targeting to Myanmar people or like foreigners, you know? And then for me, the answer is simple. It's, it's my community, my people. And then for people to for non Myanmar people to slowly start accepting us is to really like accept us for who we are. And mm-hmm. that's why Bamama, that's what Bamama came about. Uh, I was trying to heal, but at the same time, I wanted to talk about like, there's a lot of like weird Burmese, like cultures that we have. And then also mm-hmm. talk about like these culture and stigmas and stereotypes and mm-hmm. like, you know, like, and then it's it, it having these like small little reels on Instagram and making it like a satire has mm. like also given me the meaning to like, like more like giving me answers <laughs> to mm. what I want to become than actually like, you know, mm. mansplaining about our culture and stuff like that. So it was, yeah. I think that mm. was the process. And yeah, I'd also like another thing is price point as well. So when mm. I'm like trying to charge people, I like I don't overcharge them because I, I still want my community, like my Myanmar people to come and eat my food. But also mm. uh, at the same time, like like uh, make it too cheap to a point that it's like a devalued thing. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. so it, it's, uh, yeah, yeah. Figuring out that medium. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and Chiang Mai is certainly a food lover's paradise. So if you're yeah. set up in Chiang Mai, mm-hmm. I, and that's very interesting what you're saying, that there's more Burmese places. I, I don't, in my times in, in Chiang Mai, I don't remember a lot of Burmese places. And the um, aside from, I think it's Free Bird Cafe, which is a longstanding place. But um, the uh, I would find in Thailand, when I did go to Burmese restaurants, they were, they were really kind of um, suited for those Burmese that were, that were stuck in Thailand, a place for them to go. They, there, there weren't uh, of all, you know, of, of, with Thai food and Thai yeah. restaurants just being so creative and, and everything from menus to the, the architectural design to, you know, yeah. um, how it's served and everything else. I, I, I can't, aside from Freebird Cafe, which is more, yeah. which always had a history of also being an activist place. Yeah. I, um, uh, I, I don't remember it's uh, now that you mentioned that and you talk about all the great other Asian food that's there. My memory of Burmese restaurants in Thailand were were kind of you know backstreet places where Burmese just like to go get yeah. something familiar to them. So yeah. you know it's interesting to think if um, yeah. if if Chiang Mai is now also blossoming. Yeah. Uh, Burmese dishes that that can be accessible and and interesting to all food lovers to come there is is that something that you see taking shape? Oh yeah, absolutely. I mean, oh, wow. like it's it's a drastic change within mm. like the two the past two years, and it's all because from the migration, right? Who, um, mm-hmm. With all the people displaced here, yes, they do have their day job and whatnot, but it's not enough. You know, like they still got to support like family, whatever, whatever the reason is. So the easiest way for them to make like extra money is by. Um, cooking up some w- food and then selling it online or like doing like home deliveries and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. And, or some people have been able to um, uh, build restaurants even. And there's a lot of like business people from Myanmar who has migrated, who had to migrate to, um, to, to Thailand and then 
because rent is so cheap here and then like it's so it gives a very like Mandalay vibe some say but I, I think it has a very like Dongji vibe a Shan State vibe mm-hmm. and it, it, it just has that also an, an easier access to supplies as well mm-hmm. there's that mm-hmm. route from Mesai and Dachi Lake um, that trade route is much more accessible than the Mesai uh, route and also Tachile being you know a very um, uh, 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 where all the most of the drug lords live <laughs> so mm. the, the military don't really focus to like leave them alone so that mm. route has become a bit more safer and cheaper for mm. uh, supplies and trade to come in and the closest city is Chiang Mai mm, um, right right oh that's interesting so it's a real crossroads yeah yeah, absolutely. And um, and ethnic food. And originally, there's so many Karens and Kaya people who has been displaced here for years. Like, I'm talking mm. about 20 to 30 years. And then, mm-hmm. you know, um, and they got to make a living as well. And then they, yeah. So it's 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 been very interesting living here and seeing this boom. And mm. I'm, I'm very curious to know where it's going. And mm. having, like, I, I've always believed in bringing um, our community together. And mm. which is why, like, what I said before with, like, with Can Stop, Bone Stop is to highlight mm. that, the amount of diversity that we have. Yeah. Yeah, especially in Chiang Mai. Mm, yeah, that's great. That's great. Um, going back again to just your time in French cooking school and then in Michelin restaurants, I, I, uh, I saw that in one post you you contrasted it to uh, the TV show The Bear, saying that it was that was an accurate depiction to, to <laughs> some of your experience, which I thought was awesome because I think that's just one of the most amazing shows that's come out in the last yeah, year. I just love it. So um, and I, I want to ask you, uh, um, not the obvious question about French cuisine, but probably the the, the least obvious one, instead of asking you how French and Burmese cuisine are different, of which many things would strike out, I want to ask you, in what ways are there surprising similarities mm. and intersections? Mm. What did you find in the process mm. of French cuisine mm. that just randomly stuck out of like, oh my God, this is like, this This part's what we do in Burma. Yeah, yeah, there's a, there's a lot. There's a lot of dishes mm. that we do that mm. are so similar to French cuisine, which is basically the ngapiye, the fish, uh, the fish, the, the stinky fish that they think that it's stinky and like, like solely Burmese. But the techniques that we use in cooking is so similar to uh, a dish, in, uh, in a French dish called a seafood bisque, which is basically you're blending up a bunch of like uh, uh, shells. See, uh, it could be like shrimp shells or like fish bones, blah, blah, blah. And you're just blending that up into like a paste ish thing to get that uh, bone juice. And that's exactly what we do in in Ngapie as well. And as well as Mohinga as well. This is what I noticed with, with cooking with my mom recently, that the that extraction of a lot of broth from the bone broth is very similar to how in French cooking when we make stocks. Hmm. You know. And yeah, so similarities like that. Um what else is similar? Well, like butter, we don't, we don't, we don't use a lot of butter, but I guess usage of a lot of oil. Mm. <laughs> Let's just say that. So in French, yes, fat. I was, I would say oil, like fat, fat content. Mm. Um, mm. They use a lot of butter to flavor their dish or like create velocity and emulsification, whatever. Um, and then in in Myanmar. Uh, cuisine, uh, we use oil not just for um, flavoring and stuff like that, but for shelf life as well. So when you put a lot of oil in a curry or something like that, it's not just for like, we love oily, greasy food, Mm. but also for another like preservation technique which mm. is uh, um, because just just because there's no fridge storage, so it keeps longer. And same goes with French food is sometimes you cure the meat using tons of butter and then you Mm -hmm. age the meat for like months or years Mm -hmm. even Mm -hmm. um so things like that are like technical stuff are very similar fermentation as well you know Mm. 
Mm, that's great. Yeah. So let's talk a little more about what you're doing there in Chiang Mai. You've referred to both of these things in your other answers, but let's flesh them out and make sure that people know, hear these names. And, and we'll also have links in the show notes. But mm -hmm. the two main initiatives you've been working on is Miss Lunatics and Bamama. So talk about each one of those. Okay. Miss, Miss Lunatics is actually on pause right now for a little bit, but I started mm -hmm. off uh, uh, bringing it to uh, bringing my name out there uh, with Miss Lunatics, which is a fundraising platform using uh, using food as a fundraising platform. And uh, we host events and then, yeah, like pe pe ask people to co uh, pay for an entry ticket and then we serve food. And a portion of it, we uh, uh, donated. Um, so, but that is on pause. Uh, and now my focus is more on Bamama. Uh, mm -hmm. which is um, a food a food content. It started off as a food content creating, and then now it's developing into more of a community building and uh, product-based uh, uh, business as well. And um, it, it took me, it was, it was really weird. I, I actually wrote my business model multiple times <laughs> just to mm -hmm. figure out how I can gauge this brand um, in mm -hmm. the most sustainable way and also benefit the community and creates an impact and mm -hmm. also be able to run on its own without having to rely on any like outside um, um, support, meaning like an NGO. Cause like when an NGO is involved, when another organization is involved, you have to rely uh, for money to, f from them. Right. And without that, sure. In, like without that money coming in, you're kind of screwed. So mm -hmm. I don't want that. And also um, having them like uh, controlling you and like having to see in the things that I want to do. I don't want that either. So I had to figure out uh, a way to have my business run um, on its own, meaning mm -hmm. um, putting <laughs> pretty much like putting down my, my savings and, um, Mm -hmm. And um, so I'm coming up with a brand right now. And basically, uh, it's, it's Mohinga Paste. And I'm selling it um, to, like, a, it's a mass production with the goal of a mass production. But at the same time, with, uh, with an undertone of uh, wanting to hire um, Myanmar um, CDM people, maybe, mm -hmm. uh, Myanmar Displaced, or whoever needs, mm -hmm. whoever needs a job. Mm -hmm. um, I want to hire them even like part time and be able to train them as well as part of a resettlement and relocation mm -hmm. like uh, program. Oh, nice. Yeah. yeah. So so that it's easier. Like if, if they don't work here, they can go work at like any restaurant and like be able to um, still um, 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 improve, you know? Mm hmm. Yeah. Right. So the food that you're making and serving, it definitely connects those Burmese that are, are displaced like yourself and give them something familiar. And it also reaches out to the many Westerners that are in Thailand and are curious about yeah. food and culture and perhaps what's going on. But yeah. how about the, the native Thais uh, being in Thailand to what you talked a bit about the discrimination you faced there before. And I, I definitely know that of the, the difficulty of yeah. the um, of, of, of Burmese yeah. in Thailand um, mm -hmm. and the stereotypes that are there. Yeah. But to what degree have you been able to make inroads in mm -hmm. Burmese Thai friendship? Mm. So a lot of Thai uh, uh, Thais who have come to my dinners and pop-ups has been shook by how delicious the food is. <laughs> 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 and they have also been able to um, find similarities, which is a very key important thing in slowly convincing them. Like that's, that's the key thing is that a lot of yeah. Thais um, will not eat food if it's strange or new or like mm. completely like not familiar so mm. you have to like it's like kaya sausage is very similar to um uh, the the ching mai thai sausage and site one and you know they're they're like oh like this is exactly similar to like 
our sausage or like that ngapie is similar to our kapi. So like they're they're like, oh, like you guys eat like same as us. And I was like, yes, like that's what I've been tra- trying to tell you guys. Mm. So they, they don't feel that like we're too different anymore. So mm. I've noticed that. And then slowly um, <laughs> with, with, with an abundance of like um, um, Myanmar restaurants popping up everywhere, I, I keep seeing like Thai people like really curious to try out like uh, uh, Myanmar food, especially La Paye too, because like Thai tea yeah. and like there's La Paye and they're like, oh, like this is similar, uh, but different. You know what I mean? Mm, yeah, mm. yeah, yeah, right. Uh, getting to what's going on in Myanmar, the resistance movement <clears throat> to the ongoing military regime and the ongoing conflict that's there. Um, one of the things that you wrote on your social media that resonated with me more more than anything, which I, I feel uh, completely aligned with this and, and just thought it was really beautiful and, and want to to repeat this back to you and just have you unpack a little bit about what you meant by it and examples of it. So you wrote, uh, I think I only have coup friends now and I love them. I'm in a weird phase in my life, just like all of my coup friends fighting a war in my own way. So yeah. that that's that's just awesome. And I think it also that also touches upon yeah. the the weird experience of this that's that in some ways is transcending geography yeah. and culture and everything else of yeah. those people that have decided to show up yeah. and continue showing up to yeah. over two years on yeah. that there's there's this uh, this the, it's a very small community unfortunately yeah. but there's also these very strong bonds yeah. that are forged yeah. by the sacrifices that one, even when one is in safety, you know, they're not sacrifices in terms of um, uh, life or or safety or anything, but sacrifices in terms of time and energy and burden and, and all of that. Those who are are continuing to take yeah. on that burden and to keep showing up and keep yeah. carrying and doing what they can, as we said before, whether it's cooking, whether it's cleaning the streets, whether it's uh, holding protest signs, whatever it is, to continue doing that, there there is a, yeah. a, a very special and unique yeah bond that's forged by that very small community. So if if you can unpack what, what you meant by it and what stands out in those words as you hear them back of, of me reciting what you had written. Okay. So, for, so first of all, like when coup hit, right, we thought that like we completely, we had to give up everything. We have to leave mm-hmm. our homes. We have to live, leave our lives that we, we were very comfortable with. And then leaving our families that's the most tragic thing and then moving here not knowing what to do nobody has like oh i'm i have a job here secure everything like you have to find your own new identity here you know and Mm. then trying to deal with that conflict was the hardest thing for me and Mm. me as a chef and i see that with my artist friends for example like how can they continue be, being an artist or how, or like dancers, for example, how can they continue living their dream but also supporting the cause? Or do they just completely let go and then do some corporate jobs or and just completely forget about their passion and what mm-hmm. they're good at? Like, you know, like that's that's like a, a, an identity crisis that all Myanmar people has to go through right now. And and then we, at the end of the day, you still, you still got to pay rent, you know, people got to like still make their own means. So there are some of my other friends, cool friends that has to um, sacrifice their identity for, for, for money. And they, they're not happy. Right. And mm-hmm. we like with can't stop, won't stop the, mo- the, the whole idea and the concept mm-hmm. That me and my friend Nin, we like, we chat, we talked about was just to show that we are continue living our lives, our our creative background, or what we're good at, and what we've mm-hmm. always been comfortable to do, and continue living that despite whoever tried to take our life, just despite the the military trying to take our lives away, we're continuing what we're good at and what we're interested in, you know? And I think that's the most, that's, there's power in it and there's also strength Mm -hmm. in it. 
And even having within our friends, cool friend circle, there are times that even me has lost my my passion in cooking. But because I see my other friends continue to cook, continue to, or like designers continue to design or like artists continue to be like, you know, artists and music producers, blah, blah. They continue doing that. And that gives me so much strength. And that Mm -hmm. was the bond and energy that I manifest in myself that I cannot let go of my identity, but also there's this new identity of me being an activist or uh, being a, 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 a like yeah, being an activist, and like how do we how do we fit into it? And the second thing is, um, I've made friends with a lot of journalists for some reason. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, without the coup happening, you know, um, those are the kind of people that I don't really hang out with. <laughs> Yeah. Um, coming from an FB, very FB industry, it's always like just me and my customers or like mm. my old like buddies from high school and stuff like that. But I would never like hang out with like political people or like activists. Like I would never in my in my mind would like, you know, hanging out yeah. with them and talking about politics even. So because of that, you know, you have this ongoing thing, because like the retention level is very low sometimes for people like, Mm -hmm. like me who are not like politically like turned up, but because you're surrounded by that environment and you, you get, you get the energy of like, okay, like, you know, I'm, I gotta keep going. And then these things are happening. And sometimes like, you know, the, the, the pages that I follow or like through friends and then they have asked help for like, Oh, like Trish got to do like some, fundraising through food and then we can collaborate and like you know like with my sources and like my journalist crowd or like this and this and that and then it grows it grows from there and the bond is insane and especially most of them are uh burmese so um and they've they've just come over to my house for a sense of like community and a sense of home (laughs) so it's nice Um, it's nice to um, see um. them like let go of their identity of who they are even if they're journalists or if they're like really Mm -hmm. if they're really um like prominent members and what so and so they just come to my place and then just seeing them eat like a bowl of mohinga and enjoying it like as if they're my brother or my sister mm-hmm. and without having that like identity and that like stress tied to them. It was, it's a joy. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah, that's definitely true. I just kind of have a feeling that before the coup happened, especially those years of the transition when, when everything opened up to the degree it did, because I was in Myanmar many, many years before the transition, so definitely experienced the difference of when there was opportunity and when there wasn't and, and what that did. But when that opportunity came, so many people were following <clears throat> different passion projects and mm. and engaging in different interests that they had. And it, it was really cool to see all these different things kind of blossoming. But there was also, so I, I I also felt that um, to some degree there was kind of a stay in your lane kind of feel. <clears throat> you know, you might be at a social event or something, something else in, in Yangon or Myanmar where where people from different sectors would come. But when that would happen to me, even I don't know how much there mm-hmm. was to talk about. I just mm-hmm. I it wasn't um, it wasn't anything anything rude or, or or arrogant in terms of one's background or my background or whatnot. It was just kind of like mm-hmm. <clears throat> you know I'm I'm doing this and you're doing that and that mm-hmm. person's doing that and you might come together for a moment but then then you kind of go on your way and, and follow your thing and the for those coup friends as, as yeah. you call it those people who have who have showed up and especially you know a couple years on are continuing to be just as active that um, that stay in your lane mentality on one hand it's really mm-hmm. dissolved and mm-hmm. um, it, it's and I say on one hand because I think it is beautiful to recognize mm-hmm. the strengths and the backgrounds yeah. and the professions that people come in with and so it's yeah. not like it's just this this communist you know monolithic <laughs> kind of everyone's doing the same thing <laughs> people recognize their talents and their backgrounds and they excel in what um, what what motivates them and what they're good at and what they're trained in but it's dissolved in the sense that the the stakes are so high and the enemy yeah. is so fierce yeah. and this moment in history is yeah. so profound and so important yeah. that 
none of us just, and I think everyone kind of realizes this, we just don't have the luxury to be able mm-hmm. to mm-hmm. Um, to Every stay in your day, lane yeah. the same way if you care about wanting to have a movement that coalesces around a new yeah. future. And so, you know, it's um, it, it's definitely a personally speaking, and, and I guess this is also just privilege in terms of having a podcast platform where yeah. we're intentionally trying to reach out. You know, the more yeah. people I can reach out to that I don't know anything about is exciting to me um, to, to go to new communities and new 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 yeah. backgrounds. That's very fresh, as well as we have a nonprofit, uh, Better Burma, and that's active in a lot of humanitarian projects on the yeah. ground. And so that's also connected me with different people and groups. Um, but, um, um, but certainly it's, it's put me in touch with people and connected me with types of people that I, I never would have had a reason to, you know, have anything beyond a polite conversation with, but really to go into depth with who they are and who I am and how we, how we might work together and share things and trust each other and sometimes trust each other in very high stakes situations. And so it's been, it's just been very interesting how it has these kind of coup friends have, broken down and dissolved some of these, some of the stay in your lane mentality to really looking at how can we be greater than the sum of our parts? Right, right. No, I, I, I totally, I totally agree with everything you just said. And um, another thing that I want to highlight is that it is taking such a long time for a lot of NGOs to um, understand that <laughs> because mm. the funding that they give us, and this is the big issue that I discovered is the funding mostly protect journalists. The funding mostly mm-hmm. protects the media people, but mm-hmm. where is the funding that protects the artists? Where is the funding mm-hmm. that protects normal people, CDM people, like teachers, mm. engineers, like, you know, like, so even like, and there's a huge segregation. Yeah, the, 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 in, the importance of journalism and like, it's incredible. Like they're doing incredible work and putting their life on the line and whatnot. But also you got to start thinking about like other people. You know, there are people, like so many people displaced at the border right now who are not journalists. And then not yeah. having that attention given to them just because, okay, you know, like that. And then like, I think, the organizations, they need to stop se- segregating <laughs> this whole my- mentality of like, okay, if you're not this identity, you cannot be granted this and this and this and that, you know? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. yeah. Yeah. Um, and then another is the, 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 within the ethnics as well. So I understand there's 60 years of like crazy, like violence, um, struck upon them and um, some the the other ethnics they have to you know migrate to Thailand or like their villages burned down and stuff like that and that the predominant like Bama people has been brainwashed for years through like by the military about um, ethnic cleansing for example the Rohingyas um, mm-hmm. situation so like it's 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 we have to work slowly to mm. gain that trust back. So one incident was I has I have asked the Badown, the Badown people to come mm. and collaborate and like join our uh, like our festival, our event. And they were so reluctant uh, because they were like, why should we care about them? Why should we mm. care about these Bama people for like where were mm-hmm. they when we needed we when we when we need need us you know like yeah. and I was like oh okay that that makes sense and um, yeah I've I've never apologized so much for anyone mm. um, and it, it puts you in perspective mm-hmm. yeah that that it's not like as much as we think as a whole that we're very united and yes, we are like fighting through this, but there's Mm -hmm. also these tiny, small, um, like microaggressions, I would say that we have within our community and we have to, we, we, we we have to let go of that as well, but it's, 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 it's slowly getting there. (laughs) 
Yeah, for sure. And I mean, this is also not accidental. This is the yeah. this is this is the way that the British governed during the colonial period, yeah. and the Tama, the Tamada, the Burmese military, only yeah. doubled down on that and did it even yeah. more so. I mean, yeah. you just look at the the infrastructure of the country and the. Yeah. I mean, when I first got there and I saw just the map of the ethnic regions, and then learned that there was simply no roads connecting them. You know, you have to go, you you can't go from one ethnic area to the other. You have to come back down to the dry zone, Bamar area, and then go yeah. to another one. So even the literal infrastructure yeah. is designed to um, want to keep them not talking to each other and, and yeah. separate from each other. And yeah. so, you know, and I think that one of the challenges, I mean, just, just speaking a bit, um, you know, before I think we're, we're talking more kind of ground level in general, but going putting the focus on on some of the more the the, the top level negotiation and mm. consensus building that's trying to happen you know there's i've i've spoken to people in dc that are involved in projects of consensus building and right. um bringing in uh, uh the the top leaders of all the different ethnic organizations and nug and NUCC right. and such right. and just talking about how extremely difficult it is and i yeah. think that when you go from a place of divide and conquer mentality where yeah. you don't even have infrastructure connecting right. roads and where <laughs> you talk to most ethnic people. I just had an interview yeah. with a Karen woman uh, mm -hmm. uh, earlier today that was born into an IDP camp and it took her until adulthood to realize that Bamar people were not devils because the <laughs> only, as is the case of so many ethnic people, the only contact they have with Bamar are, mm -hmm. are you know, kind of, um, drug-induced um, yeah. uh, militia that are coming to mm -hmm. that 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 are, are mm -hmm. uh, the way I described it to her. It's almost like mm -hmm. these are real boogeymen. You know, yeah. you grew up with the sense of a boogeyman wanting this this metaphorical figure that's that's going to steal away children in the night. As a child, the yeah, Bamar yeah. military, they are actual boogeymen who, yeah. and to, uh, from a child's mentality, yeah. try to understand why do these people. Are, are dedicated to terrorizing mm -hmm. us. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, to go mm -hmm. from, to go, uh, uh, to go from a, that divide and conquer mentality and growing up in terror and trauma to go from that stage and then to the stage of, okay, we're going to build consensus and trust each other and work together and build a coalition. It's insane, you know, yeah. to, to make that leap. And so, so much of what I think has to happen. And I understand this is what you're doing with food. This is really great. This is what I try to do with the podcast mm -hmm. conversations we have. We also have a Burmese language podcast. We yeah. also have panels where we bring different guests together. Right. But in, in these kinds of conversations to, to do what I call sharing space right. is that we're, we're not going to push right. from, from um, limited understanding and mistrust right. to consensus building. That's never right. going to work. Right. How can we just have a safe place right. where we can just share space and right. we can just acknowledge, you know, intergenerationally, right. interethnically, diaspora versus in country, yeah. um, foreign allies that are that are yeah. that are supporting and 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 the perspective they have. How can we all just share space and have dialogue mm. and conversation mm -hmm. where we can simply acknowledge mm -hmm. other truths and other ways of being without the pressure of having to, you know, act on it or do something with it or, yeah. or come together, but just acknowledge this yeah. is, um, this is the truth of, yeah. of different types of coexisting realities. And if we can just do that, mm. if there's just a way to be able to manage those conversations and those, you know, just, just the mere sharing space, then maybe there's hope for something beyond that. At yeah. least that's what I think. Yeah, absolutely. I, I agree. Like even accepting the differences between us culturally as well within the like different families that we're growing up, like there's all these anomalies that like that we all grew up with and the differences that we have, right? Mm. So, and we have to accept and really acknowledge that it's okay for us to be together, even though we don't have the same views, even though we don't mm. have the same values, you know? Mm. And it's, it's crazy to even have like, like what, like we grew up in like, different families and like different stories and different outlooks. So like, but at the same time to come together and just, um, and just be together and respect mm. each other, um, our differences, especially. And even like, there's another thing with a lot of, um, um, Myanmar, uh, Facebook forums that I follow and then people just mm. fight a lot. And then, mm. 
healthy arguments and it's a it's good to have a good debate it's good to have like good <laughs> arguments it grows people right but then yeah. to a certain extent when you're like doing crazy stuff like social punishments and stuff like that mm. that's a bit too extreme and uh-huh. i feel a little bit like against that whole idea of yeah uh, of like mm. Like oh, I like I am right, you know. Like be, mm-hmm. if you're not with us, like you are wrong, and then we we mm-hmm. have to on on all different views, you know, whether you're Korean or yeah. Shan or whatever. Like we have to like let go of all of this first. Um, it's, yeah. Yeah, well, just holding on to a concept of right and wrong, I mean, that's a huge burden. You know, it's a huge pain to have to feel that. And when I first came to Myanmar professionally, I was leading training courses. And one of the parts of the training courses I was leading with with, um, Burmese of all different backgrounds and ethnicities was the ability to critically discuss different experiences in the training session and to be able to, to express and to listen to different understandings of what that experience was. And the first roadblock I ran into was people were, they were so afraid Mm. to be able to have different opinions. They were so scared of it. And so I had to build these sessions in that would just kind of unpack and examine where is this fear coming from? And, you know, what is the, what is the, the, well, first of all, is it possible to be able to express differences in a respectful yeah. civil way yeah. where we actually grow from it. Yeah. And if it's possible, how do, how do we do it and how do we feel? Right. And, um, and it was as fascinating unpacking that because, you know, what, because I, I came to ask it very genuinely of what's, yeah. what's preventing yeah. this deeper exploration. Yeah. And so often it was fear of offense, fear of, um, of just the mere fact that there yeah. could be differences of opinions was just yeah. intensely uncomfortable for so many people. Yes. And just wanting to use non-critical we statements that would just cover mm. those kind of critical engagements to 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 just kind of have this blanket mm. um, um, pleasantry, sugar-coated feel that um, that everything's just okay. And once we were able to get past that and be able to to have uh, experiences where we could all honestly reflect on how we felt about it, it was uh, it was just very empowering to see and much more empowering for them to experience what it was like to actually have very different opinions mm. and to mm. be able to express mm. those different opinions mm. and to feel safe and comfortable yeah. and civil and empowered doing it, you know, yeah. not scared that it's, um, yeah. that you can, you can, you can, fe- you can have an opinion about something that's so different right. than what someone else is, but that's safe to, it's, yeah. hey, it's safe to share. And you know what? It's also safe to hear. It's also okay to be able to listen to someone whose experience is, is something so different than what you could imagine. You don't need to respond to it. You don't need to, yeah. you don't need to have, you know, to put yeah. your own out there. Sure, you can can, yeah. but you can also just have a moment of silence where you just yeah. understand that this is how this person sees and experiences the world. Yeah. And I think that, you know, there is a day, just as we talk about the the, the beauty of some of these, mm. um, uh, the lanes dissolving and people coming together more from different backgrounds and people I would have never met. <laughs> um, that's very true, but it's also true that there's, um, you know, that, that because of the years of mistrust and right. intention, intentionally planned mistrust, right. but because of this, often yeah. when different groups in Myanmar yeah. don't agree with each other, yeah. they don't, they don't talk, they don't share space. They don't talk. They just kind of turn away and say, can mm. you believe this guy? Can you mm. believe what he's saying? And you mm. just get more and more segmented. Mm. And that's definitely the danger mm. right now, I think. Yeah. And also like, I mean, I don't, I don't blame all the really religious fanatics, <laughs> Um, with the whole like Buddhism going on back home, um, and especially mm. now, um, yeah, and, and then you know, Buddhism has always been part of our, um, um, our or like religion just in general, and then mm-hmm. using that to um, round people up, and then like if you don't believe us, you're going to hell, or like, mm. and that shaming culture is like, mm. I th- like not just fear, but fear of being wrong. And then where mm-hmm. is it coming from? It's like shame, right? And mm-hmm. then if mm-hmm. you are being shamed, you will be tamed, <laughs> that kind of thing. Mm-hmm. But mm-hmm. we we have to be okay with making mistakes, being mm-hmm. being uh, being embarrassing, and mm-hmm. like um, even even the smallest thing, huh? Like this is a culture thing that I noticed, like with my parents. Um, 
and also this current generation. Like, I I didn't grow up um, learning Burmese. I learned it like halfway through. Um, mm. I went through an international school and all these stuff. So um, my Burmese is not as good <laughs> as I would like to be. So only through Ku, I've like learned to read and write. Like writing, it has especially been ridiculously hard. So like I still make these mm. like, crazy spelling mistakes, and I'm so thankful to have these cool friends who are so like. Um, 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 fluent in Myanmar Burmese language, and then mm-hmm. they have this like autocorrect thing constantly going. It becomes like very annoying to a point, but at the same time, they're like, "Do not make mistakes in Burmese because like that is embarrassing. You're considered uneducated," and that's exactly even what like my mom says too. So she would like like spell check me every single time, every single place, <laughs> <laughs> and then mm-hmm. if I make one or like if my dad makes one and like they get shamed for it you know like and then Mm. and i see that in my friends i see that in like these these different groups that i'm in facebook groups and it's become like the online like like spell check like grandma nazis um Mm -hmm. and that, that that becomes like a very interesting thing for me to like um like just think like oh what kind of background did you grow up in like what are your parents like and it makes me intri- like intrigue about the, the 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 upbringing that they have and same goes with like the differences in like uh religion as well even though there's christianity this muslim family there's like buddhist family um but they all share one thing is that it's their this religion stuff um very dogmatic and very pushy and very like boundary crossing stuff. So um, with my generation and my, my parents, my mom and I got a lot closer uh, being able to talk about these stuff freely, but Mm -hmm. then to get to this point that we had, I had to establish these like really big boundaries with her telling that these mm. are things you cannot say to me. These are the things you cannot mm-hmm. say to my gay friends, you know, mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. like gay marriage is okay. And yeah. like really like stigmatized stuff. And I've only yeah. been able to do that with my parents. I haven't been able to like my other relatives are still like, like shook by the idea of like, you know, a lot of these things so like yeah. even me like not having a religion for example or uh-huh. yeah and and they're they're i come from a very like buddhist um conservative um family background so for me mm-hmm. to like go to a temple and just sit there and not pray and do mm-hmm. the whole like uh why thing and it it shooks them that i've mm-hmm. become very westernized but i'm like mm-hmm. no like and i had to tell them this like the difference of like my beliefs and whatnot and um Mm. yeah and and it was weird because my dad he's he's uh he's muslim he was muslim Mm. and he converted Mm -hmm. so Mm -hmm. our family has always been looked as even in our neighborhood as like um like like strange (laughs) it's a strange Mm. Mm -hmm. (laughs) muslim Mm -hmm. marrying a buddhist girl um Mm -hmm. And it, it's always, I always feel like an outsider, you know, like mm. that, like very singled out all the time with my mom's family who are very Buddhist and my dad's family who just don't even like refuse to see me. Like that kind of mm. stuff, like that segregation yeah. that runs like deep. And then mm. knowing all of these cool friends lately mm-hmm. and talking about like, uh, like, like, uh, like, who has similar uh, history as mine and then they were also mm, going through right. the same experience as me even mm. worse in some some situation and i'm like oh okay we're all going through mm. shit <laughs> mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah. that's what happens when you talk yeah you figure out that you're not alone with your trauma mm-hmm. and fears yeah. and, and isolation and everything else that yeah. that uh imperfect. every family is uh is imperfect in their own unique way right right Exactly. Mm. Yeah, boy, this is well. Well, this has been really great to talk about all these topics: your history yeah. of food and what you're doing in Chiang Mai, and where where food is becoming a medium to yeah. not just bring people together internally, but also right. externally speaking, be able to share the message of 
uh, of what's happening in Myanmar and put that on people's radar through food storytelling, as you call it. So mm -hmm. this, um, this, uh, it's it's just been great to yeah. hear all of this. And yeah. be before we go, is there is there any other any final thoughts or uh, or or things you'd like to leave the audience with? Uh, uh, I just want to highlight, uh, like especially. Um, people with money, especially like organizations mm. to not mm. forget us. We are still here, still going through things, still fighting, maybe not like as like out there as, as much as before, but we're still here and to not forget us. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. And for those that might find themselves in Thailand, how can they sample some of what you're doing? Um, just go to Bamama page and mm -hmm. we all have, like, we have, I, I post all, uh, all, all kinds of information there, workshops and whatnot. So it's all there. Yeah. Great. And we'll also have a link to that in okay. show notes so people can find it more easily. And okay. hopefully you'll, uh, you'll make some new friends from this. Yeah, <laughs> I hope so too. Well, I, I made friends with you, so that's great. <laughs> yes, <laughs> <right>. <laughs> when you come to sing my yeah. play, I'm cooking you some food. So. <laughs> oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank yeah, you for your, wait. your podcast, by the way. Like it's, it's been, it's been a wonder. <laughs> I've been following yeah. you. Oh, great. Oh, great. That's good to hear. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks a lot. Yeah. Mm. Well, thank you again. Thank you for appearing on. It's just been a lovely conversation. Okay. Thank you very much. Many listeners know that in addition to running these podcast episodes, we also run a nonprofit, Better Burma, which carries out humanitarian projects across Myanmar. While we regularly post about current needs and proposals from groups on the ground, we also handle emergency requests, often in matters that are quite literally life or death. When those urgent requests come in, we have no time to conduct targeted fundraisers, as these funds are often needed within hours. So please consider helping us to maintain this emergency fund. We want to stress that literally any amount you can give allows us to respond more flexibly and effectively when disaster strikes. If you would like to join in our mission to support those in Myanmar who are being impacted by the military coup, we welcome your contribution in any form, currency, or transfer method. Your donation will go on to support a wide range of humanitarian and media missions, aiding those local communities who need it most. Donations are directed to such causes as the Civil Disobedience Movement, CDM, Families of Deceased Victims, Internally Displaced Person, IDP Camps, Food for Impoverished Communities, military defection campaigns, undercover journalists, refugee camps, monasteries and nunneries, education initiatives, the purchasing of protective equipment and medical supplies, COVID relief, and more. We also make sure that our donation fund supports a diverse range of religious and ethnic groups across the country. We invite you to visit our website to learn more about past projects as well as upcoming needs. You can give a general donation or earmark your contribution to a specific activity or project you would like to support, perhaps even something you heard about in this very episode. All of this humanitarian work is carried out by our nonprofit mission, Better Burma. Any donation you give on our Insight Myanmar website is directed towards this fund. Alternatively, you can also visit the Better Burma website, betterburma.org, and donate directly there. In either case, your donation goes to the same cause and both websites accept credit card. You can also give via PayPal by going to paypal.me slash betterburma. Additionally, we can take donations through Patreon, Venmo, GoFundMe, and Cash App. Simply search Better Burma on each platform and you'll find our account. You can also visit either website for specific links to these respective accounts or email us at info at betterburma.org. That's Better Burma, one word, spelled B-E-T-T-E-R-B-U-R-M-A dot org. If you would like to give in another way, please contact us. We also invite you to check out our range of handicrafts that are sourced from vulnerable artisan communities across Myanmar, available at alokacrafts.com. Any purchase will not only support these artisan communities, but also our nonprofit's wider mission. That's Aloka Crafts, spelled A-L-O-K-A-C-R-A-F-T-S, one word, alokacrafts.com. Thank you so much for your kind consideration and support. <laughs>